All right, I'm Michael Hartzman along with Dominic Tavella, and we are thrilled to have David Lebovitz from J.P. Morgan Asset Management with us. He's a he's a global market strategist. He works with, I guess, David Kelly is the chief chief um, economic officer at this point or investment officer. Yep. David? So uh, yep. So so I work as a, a strategist under Dr. Kelly, who oversees the entire uh, global market insights team. So we have people based in New York, uh, people based in Europe, people based in Southeast Asia. So it is tru truly a global organization at this point. We we are big fans, as we said on the break. So uh, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Hey. Thank you for having me. And I guess we'll just jump in. You, 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 you did hear our first segment, and I'll just ask you the obvious question. Um, is there any equivalence between what's happening now and 1999, in your opinion? So I think you're, you're seeing some signs of, I think you guys put it, put it very well, you are seeing some signs of froth uh, in the current environment. But one of the things that, that we really always try to do during times like this, and I mean, we've, we've seen this type of investor behavior on, on many occasions over the course of, of history. And so, you know, is, is it exactly like 1999? Well, there are some parallels there. There are some parallels to what we saw with Japanese equities in the 1980s, even some parallels to what we saw with tulips, right? Those, those hundreds of years ago. Um, the thing we always try to think about is whether we're dealing with a bubble with a big B or a bubble with a little B, right? And a bubble with a little B is kind of like boiling water on the stove. You're, you're gonna have some bubbles reach the surface, they're gonna pop, you're not gonna make a big mess. Uh, a bubble with a big B is more like trying to boil a pot of milk. It's going to go everywhere and you're going to spend, you know, hours dealing with the uh, dealing with the aftermath. And, you know, again, I think part of what's happening here is really twofold. Um, on the one hand, we've seen access to equity markets continue to get taken down over the years. And, you know, you look at the ability to trade commission free, you look at the ability to trade fractional shares. You look at access to information, right? A lot of the stuff that was historically reserved for the institutional investment community is now available uh, to anybody who wants it on the uh, on, on the internet. And you couple that with this cocktail of, of quarantine and liquidity that, that everybody's been served. And, you know, it, it makes sense that we've begun to see these pockets of froth uh, across the capital markets. And so when, when we see prices becoming disconnected from fundamentals, you know, it always catches our attention. Uh, what we want to make sure of is that that behavior isn't becoming too widespread. And I think at the current juncture, you know, this is this behavior is relatively, relatively contained. You're seeing it in certain areas of the equity market. You're, you're seeing it with certain crypto assets. Uh, you know, you're not seeing necessarily widespread euphoric behavior, uh, which would really be the, the flashing yellow light from where we sit. So, you know, to us, this is more of a proceed with caution as opposed to run to the hills, because I think that, that as you guys pointed out, you know, while there are some similarities, there are a decent amount of differences between where things stand today uh, and where we are, where we were back in uh, 1999, obviously right on the cusp of the, uh, of the tech bubble going, going pop. And David, on, on that point, um, We've had pretty much we're through earnings season right now, and about 80% of the companies that reported actually showed better top line and bottom line growth. And I think the average was above plus so almost 20%. So we are seeing better, healthy numbers coming out of companies that actually reported. You, you, you absolutely are. Um, you know, what I would say about the, the dynamic with respect to earnings is to an extent, if you put a bar on the ground, it's pretty easy to step over. Um, we, we saw estimates come down pretty significantly over the course of 2020. And so I think, you know, the, the beat rate in and of itself isn't necessarily all that surprising. The magnitude of those beats, the surprise, as you pointed out, is, is really where we said, you know, wow, the, the analysts completely missed the mark. Uh, on what they were thinking around earnings in, in 2020. But, you know, now, now is really the, the time where companies are going to have to prove themselves because so much of the rally that we've seen in markets over the past 12 months has been based on this expectation that over the course of 2021, we're going to be able to bring the economy back online. We're going to see a strong rebound in corporate profitability, so on and so forth. And so now it's time for companies to deliver that, right? And I think that you know, the, the ability for companies to beat estimates by 20% in a post-pandemic world is, is obviously going to be much more challenging. We think earnings growth is going to be good this year, but I think some of those distortions that you saw, which were really driven by the pandemic, 
uh, are probably going to begin to fade. And, and the one thing we're really excited about is the prospect that corporate guidance is going to start to come back here. You know, a lot of people were flying blind for the better part of last year. And we think that managements are now feeling a bit more, uh, a bit more confident in the outlook as they look ahead through 2021 and into 2022. And I think that that information will simultaneously help analysts like ourselves, you know, do a better job at, at forecasting. Nobody talks about the fact that when earnings are beating by 20%, the analyst actually didn't do a very good job. And so, you know, hopefully that gets tightened up uh, over the course of the next 12 months. Well, I want Mike to answer the question and Nick ask the next question, but analysts just traditionally tend to be a little bit conservative in their estimates. I don't know if they missed it as much as they were kind of just being conservative in what they were putting out there. Yep. No, absolutely. They, they overestimate far out and underestimate in the, in the short term, but point, point well taken. David, I, I mentioned in the first segment, two, two, two sectors in particular, which I think have a little upside simply because it's a great way for states to close these enormous deficits, you know, as a result of the pandemic, you know, one is legalized sports betting and the other one is, is, is marijuana. Um, you know, you look at New York City, where I know you worked, I don't know, it looks like you're not there right now. Um, do you, I know Jamie Diamond brought back the traders, um, but you guys aren't back yet. So number one, do you see sectors like that as a way for states to kind of passively, aggressively try to close their deficits without taxing their citizens anymore? And do you see, you know, folks like you um, heading back to Manhattan at any, at, a, at any point and, and things getting back to normal? So um, a couple of thoughts there on the, the state and local revenue question. I, I think you're going to see governments, state and local governments, pull whatever levers they, they can grab. You know, when we look at the, the amount of stimulus that we think is going to be part of this next bill that is solely dedicated to the purpose or for the purpose of supporting state and local governments, I mean, they, they have a heck of a hole that they need to dig themselves out of. And, and my home state of Connecticut is really the prime example of, uh, of you know, budget, budgets gone wrong, if you will. And so I think that going forward, you know, whether it's, it's the legalization of marijuana, whether it is, you know, an, an increasing legalization of, of sports betting, you know, you are gonna see states and municipalities leverage less traditional revenue sources in an effort to get their budgets back on a, a more sustainable long run trajectory. But, you know, I think you, you asked a really interesting question that, that is kind of indirectly tied to, to that point about the state of budgets going forward. And, and that's, you know, when do we go back to work? And, and I'm firmly of the view that it's a question of, of when. Um, I, I think that particularly for businesses like financial services, technology, law, the most valuable capital that these businesses have is their human capital, right? And human capital is something that is best developed in person. I mean, we've gotten very good at interacting, you know, via various web conferencing technologies and, and doing things remotely, but there's something to be said from sitting down across the table from somebody and having an in-person conversation. And so, you know, I do think that we will go back to work. Um, I think, frankly, we are at the mercy of the virus and the ability to get everybody vaccinated in terms of what's going to dictate that timing. Uh, but I do think in general, working arrangements are going to be more flexible. You know, I very much envision that when I go back to our office on Park Avenue, you know, I may not have a dedicated desk in that building anymore. There may be a desk that I can sit at whenever I find myself in Manhattan, but maybe I'm working one day a week from my home office. You know, I think that what the, the disruption that the pandemic caused to our day to day really forced us to take a step back and recognize that, you know, we can do a lot remotely. We can do a lot like this. And, and that's coming from somebody who used to do 150,000 air miles every year going to see clients. You know, if I can jump on a video call, that's a better use of my time, arguably a better use of the client's time. And so I, I don't think we're not going back to the office, right? I fully imagine that 12, 24 months from now, I'll, I'll be on the train commuting into the city. But I think the way we work generally will, will be very different in the aftermath of the pandemic. And the key word there is flexibility. You were seeing it begin to take hold in the run up to, to COVID. Uh, and I think that that flexible working environment is going to be in full force uh, in the aftermath of, of the pandemic. 
David, the, the, the markets, are, I think, are clearly riding this wave that, that uh, the vaccine is starting to come into the market, into the economy, into people's arms, and the economy is going to open up. But I think it's also taking a, a, a hint that we might get a pretty large stimulus package coming out of Washington. And as you alluded to, helping the states. Um, what happens if we don't get the whole $1.9 trillion, that it's a more targeted, smaller package that... Uh, that, that uh, would need support across the board to get passed. But what happens if we don't get the whole package? So I, I think that, you know, look, the, the market tends to be pretty reasonable. And if we don't get the full 1.9 trillion, I don't think that's going to be the end of the world. I think if we get 900 billion instead of 1.9 trillion, maybe that conversation begins to shift. But we're very much of the view that something one and a quarter, one and a half is, is reasonable when all is said and done. And we do think that is going to be delivered. But I, I want to kind of take a step back to 20,000 feet and, and make a broader point that I actually wrote about uh, for our blog on the minds of investors. And, and that's when you when you think about what's driven markets up until this point, right? It's been that view that the economy is going to come back online in a pretty boomy way. And, and there's been this view that policy is going to allow us to get there. And you know, you noted earlier that despite this, this lovely kind of springtime-like day, uh, that we had here in the Northeast today, um, there's still a ton of snow on the ground. And I, I, the way I think about fiscal policy is kind of like a snow plow, right? It's clearing the road and allowing consumers and businesses to effectively get to the other side of the pandemic. And if for any reason, right, we see an underwhelming response on the fiscal side, or I would even broaden that out and say, if we were to see the Federal Reserve begin to change its tune a bit sooner than what people are expecting, right, any divergence from expectations around policy that we begin to see could very well cause pockets of, of market volatility. And so we think that Congress is going to deliver what the market is looking for here in the near term. But let's not forget, you know, they're talking about a broader recovery package for later on this year, things like infrastructure being tied into that. You know, there is a risk here that maybe not in the next couple of weeks, but more broadly in the next couple of months, we start to see a little bit of disappointment on the policy front. And that ends up being a source of volatility for a market that has basically risen uh, in a fairly uninterrupted fashion since we got the news on vaccines uh, back in November of, uh, of last year. So, David, speaking of policy, you know, the Fed has been on the record. They're not going to raise interest rates probably till early 2023. When do we start dealing about the deficit, thinking about it? You know, when does that come in the, into the forefront? So I, I think that, you know, there are three ways that you can reduce debt levels, which are obviously just accumulated deficits. Um, you can grow your way out of it. You can inflate your way out of it, or you can pay your way out of it. And, and the challenge is growing your way out of a debt load is very difficult. Inflating your way out of it is very risky. And paying your way out of it through higher taxes is something that nobody really likes to do. But we, we've blown out the deficit last year. We're going to do it again this year to pass this next round of stimulus. Um, I think that higher taxes are really much more a question of when as opposed to a question of if. And I don't necessarily think that it happens in 2021, but I do think we see higher taxes on both corporations and individuals at some point during the Biden administration. And again, that's going to be the first step to trying to get our federal finances on a more sustainable trajectory. I, I, I don't disagree with anything that's happened here over the past 12 months, uh, but I do acknowledge that the hole we're in is quite a bit deeper than where we stood uh, at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of last year. And Dave, if I can throw out one last question as we run out of time, um, the one that really worries me and not a lot of noise right now is regulatory risk. We're, we're, and, and we're starting to hear rumors already, antitrust, going after the big tech companies. Uh, what are you what are your concerns? Any ideas there? You know, I think anytime a, a given industry makes a lot of money for an extended period of time, it, it begins to catch the attention of, of regulators. Uh, we don't think that the worst case scenario is going to play out. I certainly don't think that these mega cap tech firms are going to end up getting getting broken apart. Uh, but I do believe that that the rules of the playground, if you will, could could be re re rewritten. And so, you know, it's something where we're kind of watching it in real time. We recognize that there's risk on the horizon. We, again, don't see that worst case scenario playing out, but very much do view it as a risk primarily to, to valuations, right? Because part of what these tech companies have benefited from is a relatively sluggish macro environment over the past couple of years and very low rates. And they've made a ton of money in that type of world. If their ability to generate those revenues and profits begins to get called into question, 
elevated valuations are going to be the first thing that begin to slip. And so, again, you know, we, we don't want to draw any lines in the sand prematurely, uh, but definitely view it as a, as a growing risk as we think about the next couple of years. Terrific. Thank you. David, thank you. This was fantastic. Thank you for your generosity with your time and your insight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you so much. We could do this all day, but looking forward to the next time already. Thank you. Thanks. We'll be right back with Jordan Kimmel and his guest this evening, Jeff Hirsch. We'll be right back. Thank you.